In 1989, uh, when I went to my church plant in California, I was 31, Liz was 29. Uh, I accepted the job. Uh, the salary was $30,000 a year. It was amazing. I thought I would, that was awesome because I was making $20,000 a year as a youth pastor. Remember the days when you made that kind of money? Or you just started out wealthy? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, I, you know, I took the job. They had 19 church members at this little church plant and maybe 40 people on a Sunday in church. And so I took the job. And so we no sooner got there than some uh, uh, friends of ours that we knew in the area in Stockton where we had lived before uh, when we were young marrieds um, before seminary. Uh, they owned the largest helicopter blade manufacturing company in the world. So they were very wealthy. Uh, we'd known them for years. Uh, and so they, uh, they made us an offer uh, when we got there. And they, they said, we have purchased some uh, cruise line tickets, uh, and we have some conflicts, and we can't go. Would you like our tickets? Now, there's just some things you just don't pray about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, God's will is just clear. He wants you on that boat. You know, hey, I'm feeling he wants us on the boat. So I said, sure, I'll, yeah, I'll go on a cruise. And at the time, based on my salary, I couldn't have even, I couldn't have paid for this trip. There's, there's just no way. Uh, I couldn't have got on any, any floor of this particular uh, vessel. So we, uh, we took the tickets. They paid for our air, airfare down to Los Angeles, got on the cruise line, Royal Caribbean, um, and we went sailing, you know, uh, to, you know, various islands off Catalina and, and all down to, toward Mexico. We had, we had a lot of fun. Pulled into San Diego. We're from San Diego. It was fun coming in on a ship, uh, seeing the you know, submarine there and the Kitty Hawk and everything. We're all familiar with that because our dads were both in the Navy. So we, 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 had, a, we had a blast. But when we, when we got to the boat, uh, at this massive ship, and uh, they gave us an introduction to the, the ship. And as we got on board, they were handing out, you know, your seat assignments, where you're going to eat all your meals. And so we're standing in this big old long line of people. And so we walk up to the lady, and we're in the dining room. It's a beautiful, ornate dining room. Uh, she said, oh, you, you uh, now bear in mind, almost everybody in line is a senior citizen. <laughs> Why? they've got the money to be on the boat. You know, here we were, it's like, we couldn't even afford this. There's no way. Uh, and so we're standing in line so that the lady behind the little uh, table there, she said, oh, uh, you have the pleasure of eating on that raised platform in the middle of the, of the dining hall with the captain for all your meals. <laughs> huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, so we looked at each other as a young couple and I said, do you want to eat with the captain for all your meals? Liz is like, no way. I said, no. So I, I don't either. And, you know, and the people in line are like, you're going to give, what? You're not going to eat with the captain? No, it's too ostentatious, and I want to enjoy myself. So, and if you're captain, take, take offense. It's just, I didn't, because I have a church full of captains. But anyway, so I turned to the lady in the line next to us, and I said, would you like our tickets to eat with the captain? Awesome. She took them, and we took her tickets. And they put us over by the window uh, on a table. It was beautiful. You could see the dolphins jumping as we ate and stuff. It was fun. But I ate with those people breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And yes, this has something to do with my sermon. Just stay with me. So <laughs> I'm not just talking. So, so we're sitting with these people, and they're basically all retired, and then us. And so we, we, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we get to know them, you know, blah, blah, blah. So toward the end of our uh, week cruise, uh, the, the conversation kind of went south on us. One of them said, well, we've been on this ship for a week now. Uh, how is your room? Now, to bear in mind, when we went up to our room, there was 11 floors of the ship. Ours was on the 10th floor, on the stern, out the back. We walked into our room. There's a living room <laughs> with a couch and love seats and coffee tables. There's a bedroom. There's a wonderful marbled bathroom. Then there's the patio off the back of the boat with an eight-foot slider. That's the room that we had. We were in shock. Because here's how the conversation went at, went at lunch. Hey, how's your broom been? So the one lady said, well, I can get out of bed and put my hand on each wall. <laughs> and she's, well, we don't spend much time in there because we're always you know, enjoying the boat. And so then her, the, the other lady said, well, our, ours is about that small too, but, but we have a porthole. <laughs> I'm thinking we have a patio. <laughs> still part of my sermon, don't worry. Um, and so, uh, so when they were all done talking about their, uh, their rooms, somebody looked at me and they said, hey, Marty, you and Liz haven't said anything about your room. <laughs> eh, that's, you know, it's just on the boat, you know. And they said, well, like, what's it like? And I said, well, when you come in the front door, there's a living room. Hey, living room! <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then there's a bedroom and, you know, beautiful marbled, you know, bathroom with nice towels and chocolate on the bed at night and flowers and no way. Well, th well, then there's the eight-foot slider in the patio. <laughs> Bam! 
patio. <laughs> and so within a few minutes, they were all in our room. Yeah. Because I had told them I was a pastor. Like, how do, what kind of salary does a pastor make? Well, not, no. I told them, hey, I'm a pastor. I have some very wealthy friends. Uh, and they, they purchased what I could never purchase. Oh, now it's, the, see how what I mean? It's theological, is it not? <laughs> it's highly theological. They purchased what I could never purchase. What did Jesus do for you? There you go. See what I mean? What? Only two people see the correlation. <laughs> I had people come up to me afterwards. They totally missed the sermon point last service. They're like, could you introduce us to those friends? <laughs> what kind of people are these here? Unbelievable. So what did Jesus do? He purchased what you could never purchase, which is what? Your salvation. The, the ship of salvation, if you extend the metaphor, you, you could not get on. You couldn't pay to get on because he had to pay to get you on. And how do you get on? By faith, you have to accept the free gift of salvation. You're on the ship. And there's wonders on the ship. When I was on this particular ship, still going with the analogy of the ship, they told us one night, <laughs> they said, at midnight tonight, we're having our chefs carve chocolate into all kinds of amazing forms. You can come see and take pictures of it. And then when you're done, you can eat it. Again, do you pray about that? <laughs> I went. I left Liz in the room. She didn't want, it was midnight. She was tired. I went, strolled along, saw the baby grand piano, pure chocolate and everything, thinking I'm eating the keyboard and the <laughs> legs and, you know, the benefits of the vessel. Are there benefits to being a believer? Absolutely. And Paul's been talking about that in Romans 5 through 11. He's telling you the benefits of salvation. So we're going to test because we're a church that tests. Correct? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, ho hopefully you were here last week. How many were here last week? So you remember that wonderful sermon, right? Okay, he, we'll test. The, 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 the four things that you have as a believer that are benefits are the first thing that you have in Romans 5, 1 is you got peace, peace with God. I mean, you're at peace because you've been justified in his courtroom. Uh, verse 2, you also have another awesome thing. It, oh, you're cheating. <laughs> are you cheating? You're sitting there like little lambs going, yeah, I know, it's introduction. It's what it says on the board. Yeah, you have introduction and access. God introduced you. The Father uh, had you introduced. It was introduced to the Father by the Son. Here's, he introduced you in that wonderful place. You have hope of seeing God in glory one day, uh, Romans 5, 2, etc. And then 3 to 5 is you have a new perspective of trials because now when adversity comes my way because I understand God's with me, I don't fear because I understand he's using trials to mold and shape my character to be Christ-like. Different paradigm. Uh, now we're going to look at verses 6 through 11, the, the next benefit of being justified by faith, not by works. Last benefit. Verse 6. We'll start with verse 6 to read the passage. It says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Uh, then he's going to set up a scenario. He's like an attorney arguing a case. He says, For while one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Jesus did the unthinkable. What did he do? Christ died for us. And then he says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Key preposition. You're only saved from the wrath of God through Christ, no others. We'll come back to that. Through him. He says, for in verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we'll be saved by his life. And then he said, and not only this, but we also exult in, our, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. What in the world is he talking about? What is that benefit? That's a wonderful benefit. It's the, the benefit of assurance of salvation. Assurance. I mean, like it's ironclad. Like if you're a child of God, a daughter of God, a son of God, you're, you might blow it because you're going to sin as a child of God, correct? Your sin's forgiven, but you're, or you didn't sin this week. You don't know what I'm talking about. What is he talking about? So when you sin, does that, how, many, how many sins would it take you uh, to offend God? One. And it can be a thought sin. It can be a, an attitude sin. Anything. Just one. And so if he judges your salvation based upon whether you were sinning or not, how many times would you go in and out of a justified status? Constantly. No, but Paul says, no, the wonder of salvation is its assurance is ironclad. He does not let go of you. He's got you. 
Then he's going to give you supportive evidence because he's like an attorney. So here's, here's his supportive evidence that your salvation is ironclad. Number one, your assurance is based on not your sacrifice, his sacrifice. How to get on the boat and get a room like that that I could never afford? They, wealthy people, sacrificed and paid what I could never pay. How do you get on the vessel of salvation? He, Jesus, sacrificed and paid with his life what you could never purchase, salvation. Notice what he says, verse 6. For while we, at the time, when we weren't believers, we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. What does it mean to be helpless? It's a medical term in the Greek text, to be helpless. Uh, for me, the best way I can understand what that means is I, re I reflect on what I watched when my dad died from brain cancer. It's hideous. Hideous thing, geoblastoma, the worst. It's terrible. I mean, I watched it's him slowly degrade. But you take a, a man who's totally in control of himself uh, and can do everything for himself, uh, down to a phone call from my sister Marla, who God took home uh, right after Easter this year. But she was there, flew down from Spokane to help take care of my dad before he went to the convalescent home. She called me one morning, morning at 6 o'clock and said, you need to get over here like now. Then I got over to my parents' house and I went in. My dad was in his uh, uh, skivvies, standing there as a big man crying in the bathroom, leaning against the wall. I almost still to this day can't go in that bathroom. This is what he told me. He said to me, I said, Dad, what's the matter? It was like 6 in the morning. He said, son, I'm at the point in my life where I can't dress myself. That's what he told me. I'd never, I don't think I've ever seen him cry. And so, so I said, well, that's why you have me. I said, as long as you've got a big guy like me, you're getting your clothes on. You're getting your clothes on. See, he got to the point where he's helpless. And then it went down from there to when he's in a hospital bed at the convalescent hospital. He's in a wheelchair. He needs assistance to go to the bathroom. Can't turn over in bed. You know, you're holding his hand for hours at a time. Uh, because he, he's alone and he needs someone to be with him. And I've, been, I've seen the drill. It's a hard drill. But it, it helps me understand that's what I was without Christ. Helpless. I mean, that's why it's so audacious and narcissistic to actually believe that you could do religious works to gain the favor of God Almighty. You can't. Why? Paul says you are helpless because of sin, which is awesome. That means when you are helpless, Christ comes in and does what you could never do. He says here, at the right time, he died for the ungodly. Uh, the fact that he was born in 5 BC and died when he did was no fluke. I mean, it, the father didn't look down from heaven and say, son, uh, why don't you go down now? It looks, like a, it looks like a pretty good time to go to earth. No, it was the perfect time at the right time. Christ came to help those who were helpless spiritually speaking. What did he do? Well, he came to die for our sins to give us life. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul says about the fullness of the time of God. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law, the Torah, to redeem, he gives you the reason why he was born, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might have, receive adoption of sons. It's a side point, but it's worth thinking about. In Roman law, when you adopted a child, you could never unadopt un that child. So it's just, this is a freebie. This is extra. He, if you look at Galatians, his argument is basically, do you think the God who adopted you as a son or a daughter by faith unadopts you? No. You're his based on Roman law, based on heavenly law for life. But back to the sermon. He says in Galatians 4, at the fullness of time when it came is when God sent forth the son. At the fullness of time or at the right time. Now there's two main words for time in Greek. Um, chronos, which sounds like chronology. Greek's easy. See what I mean? <laughs> chronology or successive time. Uh, that's, the, that's the word that he uh, is using in Galatians. He's born at the right time, the right chronological time. So uh, when Christ was born in 5 BC, that, that was no fluke. That was the perfect time to be born. Because if you go back and you read Daniel 9, 24 to 27, when Daniel prophesied the coming of the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, when he would come down to the year that he would come, if you go back and look at the calculations, the 490-year prophecy, he came exactly when he was supposed to, to redeem us. It's perfect timing, perfect timing. But the word that Paul uses in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, for time is not chronos. It's kairos, which means a new kind of time, like an, an unbelievable kind of time. When you think back to the day that you got married, would you not say, well, that was chronological and hopefully you remember the day, right? 
Men, you're so quiet now. It's you're scary. You know, I might forget. She will not forget. It's, it's, just, it's a chronological time, but it's also, a, 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 the other Greek word is it's a, it's a unique day. Nothing like that day. And see, he says when Christ was born, it was a chronologically awesome, perfect timing, but also a new thing because the son had been born to carry away our sin. Perfect timing. Rome, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 says, otherwise he, Christ, would have needed to suffer since the foundation of the world, but now at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. If 2,000 years ago was the consummation of the ages and God's time, time reckoning, where are we at in the relationship to the appearance of God? You're on borrowed time. He's, he's coming. At the consummation of the ages, at the consummation of, of, of Mosaic law, at that given time, God said, perfect time to be born because I gave them the law, the Torah. They've had 1,400 years to learn. You can't fulfill all of the Torah to get into my presence. It's showing them now after 1,400 years they need the Messiah. And all the other religions, the Sumerian, the Babylonian, the Grecian mythology, the Roman mythology, uh, Hinduism, all of the religions, God says, in my time of justice, it's perfect time for the son to be born. That was 5 BC. And if you want to read about the timing of the birth of Christ, chronological aspects of the life of Christ by Harold Honer, who taught me uh, uh, Greek in Dallas Seminary, that was his dissertation. Awesome book, by the way, to read about his coming. He died at the right time for you and for me while we were helpless. It says he also died for the ungodly, a person who is anti-God in all of his ways. The book of Hebrews says in verse 11, but when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater, more perfect tabernacle, not with the hands, the one on earth, uh, that is to say, not of this creation, uh, and not through the blood of goats and calves, and, but through his own blood, he entered that holy place once for all, having obtained what kind of redemption? It's eternal. You see the assurance wrapped up in this? This all leads to it's eternal redemption, not temporal redemption, it, eternal redemption. P leads to a question. If God's intricate plan to send Christ over thousands of years found fruition in 5 BC when he came, and then when he died in his early 30s, it was all according to plan. I mean, down to when he died, when they killed the Passover lamb at 3 p.m., he died exactly when that happened on the Temple Mount, when he was on Golgotha. It was all perfectly timed to fulfill the plan of God. Do you think that intricate plan can be overcome by your deviation as a believer here and there? I think not. Now, on the same token, this, this should not lead to lawlessness. Oh, I'm loving this sermon. It means I can live as however I want now. My life's covered. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer. I'm justified by faith. I'm going I'm, to I'm presume upon his grace. Oh, no. He'll pick that up in 5, 12 to 21 and in chapter 6. It says, no, God's holy. You would never presume upon grace, but never forget the fact that he who orchestrated this plan has saved you. Verses seven and nine, second point. Your assurance is based not uh, just on that point, but it's based on his love, verses seven to nine. He says, let's think about a scenario. For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare to die. He, he sets up a situation here. He said, I can think of a situation where you give me a righteous man, like a holy man, like, like a Pharisee. Somebody who uh, he, he has all these laws, rules, and regulations, and he, he is, man, he is punctilier. He's on these things all the time. I could see that somebody might step in in a scenario and offer their life to protect the holy man. And he says, but pick a good man. I mean, somebody that's really good. That's a really nice person. He said, I can see somebody daring to die for that good person. But that's not what God did. He didn't die for good people, did he? No. I'll introduce you to a, a soldier. Uh, his name is uh, Captain uh, Florent Groberg. Uh, he was awarded uh, the uh, Medal of Honor uh, for bravery uh, in battle because when his contingent was approached by uh, a man wearing uh, bulky clothing, he made the summation suicide bomber. He then ran at the guy, pushed him away, he then exploded, killed a couple people, but he saved everybody else in line where he was in his command position. That explosion was so great, it set off another suicide bomber they didn't even see. He was awarded the Medal of uh, Honor. Why? He, he went up close and personal to death itself and, and saved many other people because of his act of bravery. 
We have one of those Medal of Honors hanging in our dining room from my wife's great-great-grandfather from the 8th Cavalry U.S. Army. We understand as a couple like what that means. You put yourself in harm way, harm's way to bring life to other people. I have to ask a question. I wonder if uh, Captain Florent Groberg would risk his life to save Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. I mean, like the mean Syrian warlord, ISIS guy. Would he jump on a suicide vest to protect his life? You kind of start thinking, maybe not. That's your avowed enemy. What did Jesus do? Verse 8, well, he did the unthinkable. It says, but God, on the contrast, demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, enemies of God, Christ died for us. See, that's unheard of. You don't sacrifice your life for your enemy. No, Jesus left the glory of heaven to die for his enemies. We were the enemies. If you don't understand the love of that, uh, I'm praying for you. That's the essence of love. He did the hardest thing. He died for his enemies. Charles Wesley was so overcome uh, by this, he wrote a hymn in 1738, uh, and it was a hymn that we used when I was in a male choir at Azusa Pacific University. We warmed up before the concerts, and we'd form a giant circle in our three-piece suits. Remember those? <laughs> yeah. All these young men in their teens, uh, late teens, in these blue three-piece suits, we would stand up and sing and tune up our sections to And Can It Be, that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood me died he for me who caused his pain for me whom death pursued amazing love how can it be that thou my god shouldst die for me i, I can tell you from <laughs> having sung that song many times a cappella with 40 men it was awesome it it typically would move from a from a tune-up song to a worship song and many guys would stop and cry as we sang why that he died for me no one lays their life down for their enemy. Jesus did. That leads to a question. Do you think that the one who laid his life down for you will let your sin as his child circumvent that faith that he secured? I think not. Because once you're his child, you're his child. You may deviate as you walk through life. Your position's secure. But he looks down and says, no, I, I died for you. Nothing circumvents that. Then in verse 9, he says, another assurance of your salvation is... Uh, it's based on divine deliverance, not just divine sacrifice, but divine deliverance. He says, much more than having now been justified his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. He's spoken about this before in the first uh, five chapters. Uh, chapter 3, verse 24, verse 28, chapter 4, verse 2, chapter 5, verse 1. He keeps repeating himself. Is Paul old and forgetting what he's talking about? No, no. He's a good teacher. What's a good teacher do? You're so quiet. What do they do? Repetition, repetition. One of my professors, uh, Brandeis educated, uh, very, uh, very amazing scholar. Uh, uh, he mentored me in college, changed my life. Uh, great man of God, Dr. Hartley at Azusa Pacific. Um, he'd walk around class, uh, like his class on Isaiah. He'd walk around class and walk up and down the rows and stop at your desk for a moment and say to you, I want to review, uh, you know, like page eight of the class notes. Uh, uh, section whatever. Uh, okay, go. Tell me. What's on that page? That's what he would do. At that point, everybody's looking at their pencils. You know, nobody's wanting to look up to see Dr. Hartley's face. One time he grabbed a guy's Bible and it had pencil uh, colorings, blue, yellow, red. He picked up the guy's Bible and he goes, oh, we have an interesting student here today, folks. And he goes, there are things colored in your Bible. Young man, why are these things colored in your Bible? Well, sir, uh, <laughs> Those things that are colored are the things that I find are important. Important? It's the word of God. It should all be colored. And I'm like, I'm like oh, man. <laughs> Coloring? <laughs> yeah. Don't look at my Bible. Yeah, it was intimidating. So he's asking questions. He's reviewing. So I learned to review my notes before I walked into that class. So Paul knows that, uh, the importance of, re of review. So he reviews. How did you get saved? Delivered from the wrath of God. Justified, this is where prepositions are so important. By, by, that's the preposition, by means of his blood, not my blood. And then I, I will be saved from the wrath of God in eternity. I'll be saved from hellfire because of him. It's, it's, he says it's through him, not, not through me. Uh, judgment day is coming. Are you ready for that day? I, I, I'm ready now. 
There was a time when I wasn't ready, but I'm ready because of what he's done. I'm justified in the court of law, delivered from the wrath to come because of faith in him. And then the last thing that he th throws in here, I, I find it most interesting. Verses 10 to 11, he says, you're a share, well, at least that last point did lead to a question. I forgot to bring it up, but it, the question is this. Do you, do you think that the God who promised to keep you from the wrath will renege on his promise? No, no. Because God cannot lie. If he said, I will justify you by faith and deliver you from my wrath, then that shall be. Nothing will circumvent it. And then lastly, he says, verses 10 through 11, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Key word there, pretty easy to see. If you're married, you really understand it. Key word is reconciliation. It always cracks me up when people get married and they say, Man, we are never going to argue. Uh-huh. Yeah. Just give it a week. Yeah. Something's going to happen. You're, are you married? Or are you all single? Yeah. And if you're single and you're thinking about marriage, you're going to argue. I mean, it's just what it is. It's just a series of compromises and arriving at a place where you're reconciled, where you are typically saying, sorry, uh, honey, I'm sorry I forgot your birthday. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I forgot about Christmas or whatever. <laughs> And it's that reconciliation where the relationship's destroyed. She's usually right. Reconcile, and it's good. Okay? I've been married. This is year 39. I understand reconciliation. Uh, Jesus reconciled you to the Father. I mean, by his death, your belief in his death and resurrection. He reconciles you as a sinner to the Father, makes you a child, which leads to a very simple question. Do you think that the God who reconciles you to the Father will look down from heaven and say, based upon your deviation as a child of God, uh-oh, you're irreconciled now. No. He says, you are, ir you are reconciled. He says it multiple times uh, through the death of his son. Your belief in that reconciles you to God. Is that not comforting? What should that lead to? It should lead, if you're reconciled to God, it should lead to verse 11. What's he saying in verse 11? And not only this, but we also do what? We, ex can you see it? We exult. It's not a word you typically use. I'm feeling exultant today. We exult in God through, notice preposition, through, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, preposition, through whom? He's the means by which we receive reconciliation. Reconciliation with God should lead to not exaltation, exultation. What's that mean? that you are so overcome with the fact that he saved you, that there's moments in your life when you're driving on the train, wherever you are, you have a moment where you just say, or when you're singing and can it be, or whatever it is, you're singing, you're worshiping, whatever. It's that when you're overcome with the fact that he saved you and you stop to say, thank you. Thank you, God, for saving me. How can it be that you would die for me? Why? Because he loved you enough to die for you. And if you, love, if you love him because he's done that for you, you're going to tell him, thank you. Thank you, God. I exult you in what you've done for me. Um, it's 1033. No, it's not time to stop. <laughs> it's time to, for you to say, thank you, Lord. Will you, will you tell him? I'm asking you. Will you tell him, thank you, Lord, for saving me? I didn't hear many people here. Thank you, Lord. There's only five saved people in my whole church. Thank you, Lord, <laughs> for saving me. Don't ever forget the fact he did that. And, and don't worry about whether you're his or not his. If you came to him by faith, you are his. Walk like you're his child, but he will never let go of you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for having a hold of us. And your grip is the master grip. You shall not release us. Thank you that you're forgiving, you're merciful, you're also holy. You call us to greater things. You're patient with us. Might we live lives that reflect that we actually believe in the assurance of our faith. Might we reflect you as sons and daughters. And we still pray for that person among us who doesn't know you. Might they come to understand the fact that they were an enemy and you did the unthinkable thing. You died for them. Amen.